He is uh, currently a senior fellow uh, at the International Assessment and Strategy Center. Uh, Douglas has had a distinguished record in uh, the field of journalism uh, as an investigative reporter and as an author, and uh, he will be speaking, especially for those of you who have expressed keen interest in Chavez's connection to the FARC, um, about uh, how that has manifested itself, particularly in Ecuador and Bolivia, as I understand. Is that about right? Good. Um, we will then have Juan Carlos Urenda Diaz, who is a Bolivian attorney, offering a uh, first-hand perspective on the Morales government of Bolivia. We will then hear from Dr. Angel Rabasa, who is now a senior policy analyst at uh, the RAND Corporation. He will be talking about Colombia. We spoke a little bit about it a moment ago, um, the post-Uribe environment, uh, what to anticipate there. Um, Ambassador Kurt Windsor, good friend of ours here at the Center for Security Policy, former U.S. Ambassador to Costa Rica, a man who has uh, spent, I think, most, if not just about his entire life following hemispheric affairs, and uh, he will be talking to us about Mexico, both the uh, current situation um, and I anticipate some forward-looking uh, prognostications, particularly with respect to its implications for American. And the cleanup batter on the second panel will be Ambassador Otto Reich, who formerly was an Assistant Secretary of State for Western Hemisphere Affairs, um, had a senior position with responsibility in this matter at least once in the National Security Council and um, also served with great distinction as the U.S. Ambassador to Venezuela. He will be offering some policy suggestions that flow from all that we have been talking about in the first panel and uh, uh, by his colleagues in the second panel. So with that, Douglas Farrow, welcome. We're delighted to have you with us again. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, why I think the FARC is still relevant and, and important. Uh, going to the gentleman's question from, from earlier about why w one would believe that there were the ties between uh, uh, Mr. Chavez and, and the FARC, I think if you look at the, at the Reyes documents, which I've had the opportunity to do extensively, everything they say about the relationship between uh, the FARC and, and Chavez and the FARC and Correa particularly have proven out to be true, particularly in Ecuador, where the, everyone named in, the, in those documents has had to admit that, in fact, they did deal with the FARC. They put it, they interpret it as being um, humanitarian efforts to lead to the end of the, uh, the kidnappings, et cetera. But I think the, the, the strongest indication is, as I mentioned earlier, the Movi Movimiento Bolivariano Continental, which was the Coordinadora Continental earlier, and, and this year in their meeting in Caracas became the Movimiento Bolivariano, uh, presided over always with the one of the presidents being from the FARC. Uh, uh, Reyes had been there in the, in the, the current uh, Secretary General of the FARC is now on the, on the presidency there. They hold open meetings and they always bring in ETA, they bring in the Irish Republican Army, they bring in Hamas, they bring in other groups that are openly hosted at these, at these forums and they always proclaim their support for the armed revolution of the FARC. And if you look at the Reyes documents, the, the Coordinadora itself was founded in 2004 in the Miraflores Palace with FARC funding and the FARC is very upset in some of the documents that they write back and forth with, uh, with Chavez and others that they're not getting due recognition for the formation of the Coordinadora Continental, that they, that they are upset that people don't know that it's, that it's them. So I think there's, um, there's significant evidence there. I think w what I want to talk a little bit about, though, is the, um, how what in Colombia what the priority has been is to clear out the center of the country, as they've done over the past couple of years, and as they've done that, they've pushed the FARC consistently to the border regions. And that's why you see, instead of the traditional relationship in Ecuador of uh, the, the, uh, Ecuador simply being a rear guard area where the FARC could come and go and buy medicine and do certain things in a relatively benign way to Ecuador becoming a vital operational center for the FARC because they need it now to survive. And, I, and you see the same thing on the Venezuelan side of uh, the Venezuelan border because they now need those border regions in ways that they didn't need them before. Uh, at the International Assessment and Strategy Center, we just did a very long paper on Ecuador and its ties to the FARC. I brought a few copies up there on, on the table, which you're welcome to us also online, easy to find. Um, and it goes into great detail on the FARC presence in um, the Ecuador political system, the Ecuadoran uh, process, and the, the importance of, of Ecuador. And I want, just want to highlight a couple of things in this regard. If you look at 
the, the FARC calculated correctly after the Jays bombing on March 1st, uh, 2008, that Colombia could not pay the political cost of going into Ecuador again. And so the FARC simply has moved itself lock, stock, and barrel across into Ecuador because they actually feel safer there now than they did uh, in, the, in the prior uh, situation. And so you now see for the first time uh, large HCL labs, uh, the stuff you stick up your nose, the hydrochloride, cocaine, in, um, in Ecuador as opposed to in, in Colombia. And the other dynamic that's underway is there's no, there are no longer major cartels in Colombia that can broker international deals. The FARC now produces about 70, 75 percent of the HCL product, but they don't have an international trafficking structure to move that out. And what you see now is the, the Mexican organizations arriving in, in Ecuador to buy the HCL product, taking it, putting it on their semi-submersibles and shipping it uh, north or their, or their aircraft or their go-fast boats or their tuna boats and the different uh, methods they use. But this is facilitated greatly by two things. One is the Correa government's tolerance at, at best, uh, if, not, uh, if not embrace of the FARC, at least of certain very senior individuals in the Correa government. And second, the, the fact that uh, Ecuador, through its uh, economic crisis in 2000, dollarized its economy. So what you now have is the possibility, and it's happening, and I was down to Lago Agua and spent a lot of time on the border there uh, fairly recently, is the Mexicans are coming in with dollars that they b get from the cocaine. They can deposit into bank accounts in Ecuador uh, that are controlled by the FARC, and the FARC can simply use an ATM card now to withdraw the cash they need. It's a much easier process than it used to be where you had to, trans uh, where you had to uh, convert the money to pesos and bring it back over, and it was much more bulky and much more difficult to do. And now you have a dollar-to-dollar -dollar transaction, and what's really frightening to the people on the border is that you now have groups of Mexicans coming in and close enough to the FARC, embedded with the FARC, are particular middlemen, Mexican middlemen, who have their own security apparatuses, their own uh, people that they bring with them. They're given the rank of, of FARC combatants, and they, they deal directly with them. Uh, the, the, this process is not a relatively, uh, not an exceptionally new one. It's just accelerated greatly over the past uh, several years, particularly with the 48th front of the FARC, which does the cocaine trafficking for them, and the 29th front, which handles the weapon shipments. And so you have this um, criminalization of the of the, the border region, certainly, and on up. If you read, uh, I don't know how many of you follow Ecuador. They actually did a commission to investigate the Angostura bombing where Raul Reyes was, was killed. And the, the gist of it was a very respected academic was appointed by Correa, a friend of Correa's, who was supposed to come out and say it was all an American plot and a horrible thing. And it, he did do some of that, but he actually dug into the case rather deeply and came out and wrote an extensive document, 170 pages, saying, my God, we've become a narco state. And look what's happened to us. And, uh, and uh, he was concerned enough about whether Correa would allow the paper to be published to give a series of interviews prior to publication to make sure the information was out there. And now and then the report did come out. It's available online. It's a really interesting look at uh, an internal look at the, at, from, a, from an honest academic close to Correa looking at the situation of his country and saying, we're really screwed, um, essentially, is what, what it comes down to. Uh, so, so I think that that's incredibly important. The other factor that, you, that, bring, that comes in with this is, is Ecuador has uh, lifted all its visa restrictions on virtually everyone in the world. So what you're seeing is a huge influx of Russian organized crime and Chinese organized crime and other organized crime groups because, like water running downhill, they'll go to the place where it's easiest to operate. And unfortunately for, for uh, Ecuador, uh, that right now is, is Ecuador. So you see this, this sort of shift over there where it's much, more, it's much more complex for the Ecuadorans to manage. The Ecuadorans argue, and, I, and rightly so, I, I, I don't uh, dismiss the argument at all, that it's not their war and it's not a war that they want a part of. And if they actually began to take on the FARC in serious military ways, the FARC could very easily blow up their oil infrastructure and they would be, and they would be uh, in very deep trouble. Um, but if you look at the, the FARC and the other, as the gentleman is asking about the evidence, I mean, the, the FARC provides us with in its own words, in its own videos, ample evidence of many things. And they write, when Correa is elected, they write a letter, a congratulatory letter saying, oh my God, this is great. We're very happy that, that you were elected. They write to several of his senior officials and say, we're so glad you're there and uh, we look forward to working with you. And along the border region, they begin registering Colombian FARC supporters as uh, Ecuadorans to vote in the elections on behalf of, of Correa, something that's been amply documented in the Angostura report and, and other things. Finally, uh, as I'm running out of time, I'm gonna, I think one of the things that we don't look at seriously, and it goes a little bit to what Norman and others were saying er, uh, earlier, is this particular book, which is called La Guerra Periferica y el Islam Revolucionario, uh, 
uh, per peripheral warfare and radical Islam, origins, rules, and ethics in asymmetrical warfare. It's, a, it's not a very, it wouldn't have been a very important book. It's written by a Spanish academic. Uh, essentially, the thesis of the book is that Osama bin Laden and Carlos the Jackal have showed us the way to defeat the empire, uh, that we can move forward and uh, it, because we, if we take off all the preconceived notions we had about killing civilians, the use of biological weapons, the use of, use of nuclear weapons, we can defeat the empire being the United States. And this would have been a very unknown and, uh, and miserable little book on its own, except that uh, President Chavez got a hold of it, invited the author to give the primary, uh, the keynote address at the Asymmetrical Warfare Conference in 2005, and has adopted this as Venezuelan uh, military uh, theory, and he had pocket-sized editions of this book printed up and, and given to every officer in his corps. I can show you the, uh, the pocket-sized version with orders to study it and, and really immerse themselves in this type of military uh, theory. The person who wrote it is neither Muslim nor a military man, but his, his uh, thesis is that the South has to ally itself together against the empire and defeat it, and this is the way to do it. And just to finish, if you look around the world at the only group capable of doing the type of warfare that this group, that this gentleman uh, describes as Hezbollah. And if you look at the relationship between Chavez and the FARC, uh, Iran, Hezbollah, it's not hard to see where part of that relationship is going. I'll leave it there. Terrific. Don't, thank you so much. Um, next we have Juan Carlos Urenda Diaz uh, with his perspective from Bolivia of Bolivia. Welcome. Thank you very much. Well. Uh, I'm going to talk about why the Evo Morales regime is a threat to the continental security. Basically, uh, I'm going to point out several points. The first one is an increase of the production of cocaine in Bolivia. Ever since Evo Morales, who holds two po public posts, is the president of the, of the republic and the president of the six unions of coca producers. Uh, became president of the country, coca and cocaine production has surged by 300%, and it's being sold fundamentally through Brazil and Argentina, with Europe being its final destination. A large percentage of this may also be entering the US. Bolivian allows for a maximum of 12,000 hectares of coca crops to be grown for traditional uses and consumption, but under the current government, there are now over 3,000 uh, hectares being grown, according to the United Nations report. Second point is the relations with Iran and the uh, potential supply of uranium. Bolivia never traditionally maintained relations with Iran, but under the Evo Morales regime and Hugo Chavez, it has become an important ally to our country. The president of the country has publicly uh, 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 agreed to the nuclear program of Iran publicly. Therefore, and since uh, Bolivia has significant reserves of uranium, lithium, <coughs> and other minerals, the provision of uranium uh, to Iran is very likely. As a matter of fact, the Potosí governor, is Potosí is one of the provinces of, of the country, has acknowledged the exploration already of uranium. On April, with, with, with the arms built up, built up with Venezuela and Russia, on April 2nd in Caracas, Venezuela, hand in hand with President Hugo Chavez, Evo Morales participated in signing an uh, agreement with Russia for the purchase of weapons and has committed Bolivia to purchasing $150 million of weapon. In addition, Russia has offered Evo Morales government a nuclear energy plant and the provision of massa, mi, mi, missiles. The US ambassador and agencies expelled. As you know, on September 10, 2008, President Evo Morales expelled the US ambassador in Bolivia Philip Goldberg. Shortly after, he also expelled the Drug Enforcement Agency, DEA, and the U.S. Agency for Cooperation, USAID, leaving the country exposed to drug trafficking. There is now not in no, there are not international control 
over the drug trafficking at all in this country. Now I'm going to mention some internal uh, violation of basically human rights that are uh, important for the continental security in the sense that this, this type of violations and, and destruction of the democratic system can be imitated not, not in the United States but, but in the other countries of the continent. From the government in public statements and with the full knowledge of the President of the Republic, acts of state abuse are being committed as are frequent massacres, such as that carried out by police and military forces in the city of Sucre in November 2007. Another of these cases, the execution of three foreigners in the Las Americas Hotel held by elite police forces under the express order from Evo Morales is being used by the government to pressure <coughs> the opposition in the Department of Santa Cruz, criminalizing the politics and judicializing the politics. Under the allegation of these uh, three foreigners were in, in act of terrorism. These persecutions are carried out manipulating both the courts and the public prosecutor's office in violation of the principles of due process and natural jurisdiction. And testimonies are being obtained by means of torture. The government of Hungary, Ireland, and Croatia have demanded an international investigation in this cause, in this case, but Evo Morales has given them little importance. S -s clear signals of destruction of democratic principles. The division of powers has disappeared. Evo Morales controls the judicial, legislative, and executive branches. Uh, um, about the, uh, 10 days ago, the, ju the, the legislative branch gave Evo Morales the full power to appoint by his own criteria all the members of the Supreme Court and the uh, Constitutional Court. Uh, and anyone who does not follow his orders is susceptible to lawsuits. The government also encouraged community justice, which is used to pursue the opposition as occurred with indigenous leader Marcial Fabricano and former Vice President of the Republic, Victor Hugo Cárdenas. These forms of political violence are justified by the government based on the new constitution approved illegally, which contain racist, racist clauses that violate the equality, the principle of, of equality and the, of all the citizens, citizens under the law. I have brought, I have, uh, brought a, a dossier that uh, sustain all what I have uh, mentioned here that I, I will give to Nancy copies but basically also I have uh, brought a paper written by myself in, in that is in, in English that is called the state <coughs> of Catoblepas. Uh, Catoblepas is a monster that divorces itself, it's a mythical uh, monster um, that I describe the critical aspect of this news constitution that basically is, a, I consider that is probably one of the first constitutions that is racist and, um, and that by itself destroy the principle of, of a liberal democracy. Uh, this is uh, quite important because this is probably the, the, the blue book of the, this 21st century socialist uh, that uh, f is following the, the government of Venezuela and the Chavez. Uh, regime, and this is uh, also important because the rest of the countries of the continent, especially in South America and Central America, uh, may uh, look at this uh, process and and may follow this uh, this uh, regime, this path. Basically, the the this uh, 21st century socialist regime is to get elections through votes and then once in power, turn this in, in autocratic and, and autocratic uh, regime. Uh, the Constitution of Bolivia didn't allow, for instance, the presidents to, to re-elect, and in Bolivia, Evo Morales has modified the Constitution and has been re-elected, and there are signals that he may be, again, uh, calling for a, 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 uh, a vote for a plebiscite to, um, get for another another term. Um, 
so I will I will provide uh, Nancy a, a dossier of documentation that's uh, sustain what I have mentioned and basically uh, this uh, um, paper that uh, in in English and in Spanish um, um, recall and accounts the the the, as the critical aspects of the Bol new Bolivian Constitution. Thank you very much. Juan Carlos, thank you. Um, an important assessment of yet another of the places where this sort of Chavista playbook is is um, rolling out. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Anhal Rabasa from uh, Rand speaking about Colombia, the uh, post Uribe Colombia. Okay. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, if we were doing this in, in Latin America, uh, I would take the next 10 minutes to acknowledge all of the distinguished members of the panel and distinguished members of the audience. Uh, unfortunately, we can do that because all I have is 10 minutes. So I'll have to just limit myself to thanking you, uh, Frank, and, uh, and Nancy for you know, organizing this, uh, this important event. And I, I par I'm particularly pleased that, uh, that you have given me the opportunity to talk about, about Colombia. So I, I had been um, uh, following uh, Colombia for, since the 1970s, and this is before the upsurge of the FARC that dates to early 80s or so. You could travel in those days through uh, Neiva and places that later became FARC strongholds and be perfectly safe. Uh, and uh, very intensively um, over the last, uh, the last 10 years. And um, what I would say is that, that Colombia uh, and U.S. assistance to Colombia since the inauguration of Plan Colombia in 2000 uh, is really a model, a model for uh, counterinsurgency and for U.S. assistance uh, to a government fighting an insurgency. And, uh, and if you go back to the, the mid-1990s, uh, you can see how dramatic the change has been in the situation in Colombia. In, in the mid-90s, it looked as if the FARC was about to take over large uh, parts of the country. They, in <coughs> fact, were able to defeat in combat battalion-sized units of the Colombian army. Uh, U.S. assistance uh, was so dysfunctional that it was just completely focused on counter-narcotics. So that if a FARC uh, unit was attacking a, a town or a police station or a military unit, the Colombians could not use helicopters provided by the United States unless there was a counter narcotics interest involved. Uh, all of this, you know, has been you know resolved over the the, uh, the last uh, ten years. The change, actually, uh, to be to give credit to those who uh, uh, to whom credit is due, began uh, a couple of years before the inauguration of, uh, of Uribe when General Tapias was a commander of the uh, Colombian Armed Forces. Uh, but it was Uribe who really, uh, really changed the, uh, the Colombian counterinsurgency paradigm and, and he did it by uh, implementing you know, classical counterinsurgency doctrine. Uh, that is to say, uh, a, a strategy that centered on the consolidation of control of territory and protection of the population. And I think what Colombia has accomplished has much to, uh, uh, to teach us at a time when we are involved in a very difficult uh, counterinsurgency campaign in, uh, uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, Uribe uh, increased uh, defense spending by, by 30%. He imposed a special tax uh, to support the uh, counterinsurgency efforts. He increased troop strength by 80,000 uh, between 2001 and 2004. Uh, it began to involve the population in the counterinsurgency, counterinsurgency campaign by building civil defense units in areas under, uh, uh, under threat by, by the FARC. And it established a police presence in every one of the country's municipios, which is the territorial jurisdiction. There, there are about a thousand uh, municipios in Colombia. Uh, before Uribe, about a third of them had no police presence, which meant the FARC could walk in at any time, could intimidate local officials. Uh, he ended that, and now every single municipio in Colombia has a, um, a security forces uh, presence. Uh, but I don't have enough time to, to go into all that, that has been accomplished in Colombia. I uh, just want to uh, focus on a couple of things that I think are not very well known in the United States, but are very significant to the success of the Colombian counterinsurgency campaign. 
uh, and one is that the Colombians uh, were able to, uh, al uh, to align operations with, uh, with intelligence. Um, and this is a very critical factor that took the Colombians years to accomplish with U.S. support. And what happens now is that they have dedicated units uh, uh, to, uh, to pursue particular high-value targets, these are senior FARC leaders. Uh, once uh, the location of, uh, of these individuals is, uh, uh, is found through technical intelligence and human intelligence sources, the Colombians can uh, call in troops and airstrikes within 24 hours. And this has been very successful in decapitating uh, the FARC uh, along uh, many uh, uh, regions of, of, uh, of, uh, of Colombia. Uh, the other thing that, uh, that's, uh, that's very important that the Colombians have accomplished is that now they are moving from counterinsurgency to what one could call the post-counterinsurgency phase. Uh, the Colombians believe that the FARC has been, and I think they're right, that the FARC has been strategically defeated. It has been driven out of strategic parts of the country into the frontiers. Uh, they're not out of the woods yet. And I'll, I'll, at the end of my talk, over the next five minutes, I'll mention some of the very significant challenges that the next government is going to face. Because even though the FARC has been broken, in the sense that they no longer, the central FARC leadership no longer has command and control of the units uh, throughout the country. Uh, this was demonstrated by the famous uh, Operation Hake, or Operation Check, you know, the rescue of Ingrid Betancourt and, and the others, where the, the, the group that was hosting, uh, holding the hostages was completely fooled by, it's an extraordinary operation. But what it showed is that the leadership has lost command and control. Nevertheless, there are problems that I'll mention uh, having to do with Venezuelan sanctuaries, by the way. This is, uh, again, a critical factor here. But now they are moving to the consolidation of the state. So the challenge uh, for Colombia, as, uh, as they see it now, is not so much to mop up the FARC, the FARC, but to bring the state to areas of Colombia that had never had a state presence ever in the past, where the state had completely neglected uh, those populations. Uh, last time I visited, I was... Uh, flown by helicopter to a place called Montes de Maria. On the, that was a previous uh, FARC stronghold on the northern coast. Uh, the population was terrorized by the FARC. This was a scene of a major paramilitary massacre. Uh, now they're beginning to come back. There, is, uh, there are Colombian Marines who are there stationed. They're helping uh, uh, the locals uh, resume some level of normality. They have arranged with supermarkets in Bogota to purchase the local avocado production, which is the big thing. This is what they're doing at the local level, reconstructing the country. And to do that, they have established a very sophisticated mechanism they call the Center for Coordinated Integrated Action at the presidential level, which is supposed to coordinate the, the efforts of all of the agencies of the state to bring in a coordinated, integrated response to rebuilding the state, something that we could learn as we try to do something analogous in Afghanistan. Uh, now, uh, what are the challenges? Well, uh, the challenges are the following. Uh, first of all, uh, the Plan Colombia uh, aid is coming down uh, very drastically. In fact, uh, Plan Colombia is due to end uh, within the next few years. Uh, so far, aid levels have come down by 30%. And the U.S. is engaged in what they call the Colombianization or nationalization of U.S. assets in Colombia. The Colombians believe that they can fill this gap with their own resources. Uh, however, there are going to be certain gaps, uh, certain critical gaps that we, would be very difficult for the Colombians to fill. For example, maintenance of air mobility assets, uh, intelligence platforms. So it's incumbent now on the United States government to direct whatever aid uh, we can provide to those critical needs of the Colombians. Not to give them what we think is good for them, but what the Colombians think they need. It's very important. Uh, uh, the, second, uh, the second challenge uh, has to do with the continuation of this state reconstruction effort. Again, uh, it's, uh, 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 it's going to be difficult for the Colombians to extend this effort throughout the country. Uh, they will need uh, assistance. Uh, AID has actually provided very significant support in this regard, and uh, that will have to be continued. But the major, uh, the major challenge for the Colombians is that history shows that insurgencies cannot really be defeated if they have sanctuaries across the border in other countries. So the Colombians are very, very concerned. Of course, they have to be diplomatic in what they say, but they have to be very concerned 
about the fact that, as uh, was mentioned by Douglas earlier, that uh, the FARC has uh, really moved uh, in, in lock, stock, and barrel in some ways, not only into Ecuador, but also into Venezuela, and that, in fact, the entire uh, Caribbean block of the FARC has moved to Venezuela. So now we have the situation where the FARC is uh, waiting on the Venezuelan side of the border, waiting for opportunities. Uh, Chavez has been grappling the saber, uh, purchasing large quantities of Russian arms. And one scenario that cannot be dismissed is, again, the possibility that if the domestic situation becomes very dire for Chavez, that he may, may rely on an external adventure. And that means, of course, Colombia. Uh, which, by the way, uh, is, uh, could be the subject not of a conventional attack so much, but of asymmetrical warfare. And I will end in the last minute by saying uh, that the Chavez uh, gover government and its allies are pursuing a campaign of asymmetric warfare against Colombia and as against Peru as well, as was documented by an investigating commission of the Colombian parliament <coughs> relating to the Casas de Alba and other uh, such entities in, um, uh, in Peru. But Colombia is you know, particularly susceptible to, uh, to this type of uh, threat. So I'll stop here again by highlighting the enormous successes of the Colombia, uh, Colombians in their counterinsurgency campaign, <coughs> but still uh, the problems uh, that lay ahead are quite serious and would require continued US support. Wonderful, and how thank you. Um, we turn next to Ambassador Kurt Windsor to talk about uh, the most immediate of the hemispheric challenges uh, to this country, namely our neighbor to the immediate south, uh, Mexico. Ambassador Windsor, welcome. Thank you very much, Frank, and uh, it's very good to be with you all. I've had this opportunity to share uh, my concerns about is what, what is happening to the immediate south of the United States as well as the further areas to the south. What uh, my colleague just described, the success of the Colombians, both against the FARC and against, to some extent, the drug cartels, has, has in a f moved the battle, the struggle, from uh, Colombia to Mexico. I'd like to talk about the effect of the warfare in Mexico without getting into too much detail. I'd also like to talk about the fact that Mexico, as I think Frank alluded, is a tip point for US national security because of its proximity and because of the enormity of the problems associated with our frontier and because Mexico and the United States share in many senses the most differentiated border that exists anywhere on earth in terms of economic uh, disparity. This uh, is a phenomenon that we deal with sporadically because the politics of it are also our politics. I won't go there right now, but that's a major factor. Mexico today is very much akin to where Colombia was seven to eight years ago, where the cartels were battling for position, where the government was struggling with cartels, and uh, in the case of Mexico, they don't yet have a full-blown guerrilla movement. They've had shades, they've had hints of it, but no immediate problems. However, the problems that have grown out of the cartels are immediate and uh, have become very serious indeed. Uh, there was a conference uh, in Merida that uh, supposedly offered U.S. assistance to Mexico. Uh, I would say the evidence suggests that very little has materialized from this beyond some understandings about U.S. interests in counter-narcotics. Mexican interests in counter-narcotics are mixed. If you're a Rolex dealer, if you're a real estate dealer, if you're a banker, what's going on in Mexico right now is pretty neat. Because if you're wealthy, you can buy security, you can buy an armored car. You don't yet have to use a helicopter as they do in Sao Paulo because of endemic violence. But you can get along. Not so the common people. Because the warfare that is going on within Mexico, and which is, if anything, increasing, has stymied the government. The government's objective is not so much to shut down right now the cocaine flow. They'd love to do it, I suspect, although it brings huge amounts of money and in very complex ways benefits Mexico. 
But the, the threat of the power of the cartels has led Mexico to put its major efforts into dividing, splintering, and dealing with the cartels militarily in a way to keep them from becoming uh, an overwhelming force. Uh, this is not something that we hear about up here because we are not, I don't think, aware of how complex and how uh, dynamic the cartel battles and uh, differentiations are within Mexico. But the Mexican government, principal problem in dealing with the cartels today is to keep them off balance. That from their point of view, to achieve a kind of equilibrium that would reduce violence, bring peace, and by the way, and this will never be said publicly, uh, make sure that Mexico benefits in some way from the huge cash flows that are coming into the cartels, much of which sticks to Mexico. There's been a past wave of violence, which is largely past, where Mexican cartels took over, essentially, most of the Colombian cartels. There was simply so much money involved that they felt they did not need those cartels. And now elements within the cartels themselves in Mexico feel they don't need the old cartels of Mexican varieties, so much of the funds available. So the splintering and the disequilibrium that has occurred in a sense has complicated the government strategy which was working when there were larger and fewer cartels. Uh, so they now in effect are struggling and some say even favoring one of the Mexican cartels in order to have less violence and to have a better sense of control. Complicated? Yes. But I think we should be aware that it's complicated. Today basically uh, in, in Mexico uh, we have a, tr a really serious blowback from the violence that is affecting essentially the common people of Mexico. You don't hear about the rich families being, unless they're narco rich, having a security problem. The narco rich families are in wars, so you do indeed see the, ba the battles and the casualty lists from them. You see it from the government and the local governments and the federal government even fighting the cartels. You don't see it from the elite. This is an interesting but not entirely unpredictable factor. So what's going on basically <coughs> is that Mexico is looking at a situation which is reducing many elements of its economy while in effect more money is flowing into the country. Tourism is down. Manufacturing is down for two reasons. New companies do not want to take the, the risk of violence uh, that would be associated with coming into Mexico. Small business, which traditionally has been very important in Mexico, has been victims of extortion arising out of uh, the breakdown of uh, law and order in key areas of the country. So, in effect, small businessmen are preyed upon by often uh, sidebars from the, uh, the, the thugs that are the warriors for the drug cartels. So you're seeing an economic dislocation there. And finally, and uh, very importantly, uh, you're seeing a, uh, an upsurge uh, in, in political fear and pressure on the government from people who are being forced to uh, take extraordinary measures to defend themselves and look to the government who's narrow victory some years back was based on their plan or their claim to be able to reduce the violence. They've tried to do it, but for various reasons I've just touched on, they're not succeeding. Uh, if I've created a somewhat complex picture, very complex picture perhaps, that's my intention. It is. And it's one in which the United States government is not playing an effective role because we look at Mexico as we look <clears throat> at Colombia, as we look at other areas of the hemisphere with, and I believe the, the term malign neglect should stick because it's a very good one, Latin America is simply at the bottom of the totem pole of U.S. interests today. The reason we're not paying more attention to what's happening in Venezuela or to Iranian adventures in the region is that we are distracted. I would say we are putting more of our national security interest right now 
in Africa than we are in Latin America. Uh, it's a frightening thing, it's been, but it's been true, I would say, since the end of the Reagan administration. Latin American assistant secretaries of state, Otto, I'm sure, will comment on this, uh, have, in effect, been denied the, not the access, but the attention that the region deserves. And that puts them at a tremendous disadvantage. And it allows, basically, the narcotics issue to drive our national security perceptions. And this is crazy. Bad it is, but it's crazy to reduce our attention and our aid and our active influence in the region to anti-narcotics efforts. This is politically insane. I would like to speak to several other issues that aren't much addressed about Mexico because it's not bad enough that the country is uh, seized with violence and uh, convulsion that we've just talked about, but it has been uh, ignoring fundamental issues within the country itself, quite apart from the narcotics and the destability of narcotics. My friend Roger Pardo Mara has written an excellent paper on this, which is beginning to get attention. And he raises basically seven questions or seven issues, none of which we think about much up here, but which will immensely affect Mexico. And in terms of the U.S. border, immensely affect the United States. One of which is water. Mexico is not allocating its water wisely. There are water shortages that are already beginning to manifest from uh, uh, needs of cities that are not getting it. Water coming across the border from the United States is becoming a problem because we're still using tremendous amounts of irrigation in northern, well, in southern California to raise alfalfa. Flood irrigation. It's insane. No, that's a whole other story. But water is a major problem for the future of Mexico, just as it is for China. And I, pred I would predict a number of other countries in the future. Oil. Mexico's corrupt union movement and uh, various other factors have led the Mexicans to neglect the maintenance and uh, indeed improvement of their oil fields. Mexican oil production is declining precipitously, uh, dropping uh, as much as 14% in the past year. Competitiveness. Ross Perot's great sucking sound, if you'll recall, the campaign of uh, some years back, today is not jobs going out of the United States to Mexico, it's Mexican jobs that are going to China or have already gone to China. Regionalism, tremendous problems in terms of the south of Mexico vis-a-vis -vis other areas, poverty and indigenous peoples. Mexico even has demographic problems. Yes, a lot of young Mexicans come to the United States, but uh, they have no place to go. Uh, within Mexico, this destabilizes, as we well know, uh, U.S. and uh, other political issues, but it's also going to create tremendous instabilities in Mexico itself. The exportation of Mexico's underemployed young people is no longer an option for the long term, which Mexico can assume will be covered. I'd like to wrap up with basically two recommendations. One is a radical one. I believe the only way that we can help Mexico in its present convulsion of violence, Bolivia, Venezuela, not Venezuela, this one, Colombia and, and Ecuador, is basically to legalize a, a narcotics up to a certain point. And I would include pot, long overdue, although pot is no longer the principal uh, product of the cartels. And I would argue that cocaine itself perhaps could be legalized, and not crack, cocaine itself. Because until you interfere with the market mechanisms, uh, we've shown that we will not interfere with the demand mechanisms here, but we can interfere with the market mechanisms. The destabilizing of Latin America and other areas of the world is going to simply continue. And I will wrap up with that. My second point would be to uh, strongly support Norman Bailey's argument that the United States should find a way and other resources in petroleum areas than Venezuela, because I believe that would deal with that problem and in a way that would be, shall we say, nonviolent. Thank you. Ambassador Windsor, thank you very much, particularly for that uh, quite provocative <coughs> first recommendation. We'll, I'm sure, have a chance to visit about that a little bit. Um, you introduced perfectly our uh, 
wrap-up speaker, uh, one of the assistants of secretaries of state who had access, but uh, not always the attention of his superiors, uh, despite, I think, valiant efforts and, and certainly a, a compelling case. At least I didn't get an elbow for him. No, you didn't. Um, <laughs> Welcome, uh, Otto Reich. Thank you for joining us and for uh, hopefully giving us some other recommendations, perhaps provocative as well. Thank you very much, Frank, and uh, <coughs> thank Nancy also for organizing this event. Uh, I'm, I'm impressed by the, the way that everybody stuck to their 10 or 12 minutes, and I will try to do the same. I'm supposed to wrap up and provide some policy recommendations. I think wrapping up is relatively easy. Uh, what the United States is confronting in the hemisphere today is a major challenge to our security. From an alliance called ALBA that uh, was created actually in Havana, it is not new, uh, it, is certainly, it is only the newest iteration of an effort that Fidel Castro created in the 1960s. At that time he called the Tricontinental where he joined together the radical anti-American terrorist and any other group that uh, would follow his view of a hemisphere uh, free of the United States. Uh, today, that is being financed primarily by Venezuela, by Hugo Chavez. So it was created in Havana, but it's being funded by Venezuelan oil. It, it, the, the, it's a snake that, uh, you know, whose tail reaches all the way down to Bolivia, through Nicaragua, through Ecuador has gotten into places like Honduras where it was expelled constitutionally uh, by, the, by a uh, Honduran population that learned the, the, uh, the separation of powers and that did not fall for the mistaken prescriptions of the U.S. government. I really don't know what's happening to the U.S. government today. Uh, we are making a lot of mistakes. The first mistake is we're not recognizing this challenge that we're facing in the hemisphere. The, uh, the fact is that this ALBA alliance, which is nine countries, uh, three Car small Caribbean countries, which I never really mention, I don't want to pick on them because they are so poor and so small that when Hugo Chavez comes around with money, as he does, he bribes people with enormous amounts of money. It's very hard for the leaders of a country like Dominica with 100,000 people and no resources to turn down uh, the, the bags of money that come from Caracas. Some of the other countries are much more dangerous. And uh, we, the United States has to have the political will to recognize this aggression that is taking place. The aggression is not the aggression of the Cold War where you know, that can be countered with missiles and uh, conventional weapons. We are being undermined, our interests are being undermined by subversion. Uh, we talked about the FARC, we talked about other, we, perhaps we haven't even mentioned some of the other groups that are being funded by, by Chavez and by ALBA. Uh, the fact that Mr. Chavez has involved himself with money in many electoral campaigns in this hemisphere we know, for example, that he gave millions of dollars to Christina Kirchner, the current president of Argentina, who was here in Washington not too long ago and received as if she were just another politician who had won a campaign. Uh, there was a trial in Miami in federal court, which clearly demonstrated that the go Kirchner government received at least $800,000 from Chavez. That was actually one shipment of what was a $4 million Contribution, contribution, illegal contribution, illegal under Argentine law, and illegal even under Venezuelan law. And that's why it was done surreptitiously. The same kind of surreptitious contributions have been made in Ecuador, in Peru, in Bolivia, in Nicaragua. I've spoken to businessmen who have told me they have been ordered to take money to some of those countries, cash, for the campaigns of people who are today in power in some of those countries. Some of those campaigns failed, like in Panama. There's no question that the losing candidate received money from, from Chavez. The winning party, the FMLN in El Salvador, did receive money from Chavez, illegally, surreptitiously. Uh, there's a number of ways that we're being challenged. The, the military buildup in Venezuela, financed by the Soviet Union, so, sorry, by Russia, Freudian slip, uh, by Russia, uh, by Iran, the connections with Iran, which we've talked about here today, 
the connections with radical Arab groups, Hezbollah. Uh, yesterday it was mentioned, Frank mentioned, that the, the Washington Times talked about a Pentagon report about Iranian special forces, the Quds forces, being present in Venezuela. If this is not a direct challenge to the United States, then what is? But what is our government doing about it? Frankly, what our government is trying to do at this moment looks like they're trying, they're still reaching out. What President Obama said in his inaugural address about reaching out to those who are oppressing their peoples. And by the way, every one of these countries are oppressing their people. These governments of ALBA are oppressors. They have no freedom of the press. And I understand, for example, Telesur, which is a, a, an organ of the Venezuelan government, is here today. And I, and I wish that they would uh, ask their owner, Hugo Chavez, to have freedom of the press in Venezuela so that people, when they speak out in Venezuela, are not thrown in jail like Osvaldo Alvarez Paz, uh, a, member of, of, a former member of Congress and a very respected a passive, fat pacifist, person who's never been accused of any, any crime, was thrown in jail for saying exactly what everybody in, in the world is saying is taking place in Venezuela. Uh, so these aggressors, who are also oppressors, um, are being funded by Chavez. What should the United States do? People say, oh, there's nothing we can do about Chavez. That is completely false. There's three things that can be done right now that do not require any legislation. It would take executive action. They have been recommended by the staff of the National Security Council and others at times. I know, because I was one of those who recommended it. And frankly, I didn't win the argument. Uh, at that time. At some point, I think these things will be done. Just like uh, the United States in 1941 refused to declare an embargo of oil and, uh, and scrap iron against the Japanese until it was too late, I think the United States should do three things on Venezuela right now, which is the principle, it's, it's the head of the snake. Uh, the brain is in Havana, but the head is in Caracas. Number one, declare Venezuela to be a state sponsor of terrorism. The evidence is there. The, the State Department has it. The Defense Department has it. The Congress has it. The political will is missing. Number two, revoke the visas of Chavez's business allies, business partners, the, what the Venezuelans call boliburgueses, the, the Bolivarian bourgeoisie, multi-millionaires, in many cases billionaires, who own homes in the United States, who travel back and forth, and who are the ones that carry those bags full of money to the Daniel Ortegas or the Ollanta Malas in Peru or the Evo Morales in Bolivia when he was running for office or to Cristina Kirchner in, in, in Argentina. By the way, uh, the government, uh, Lula, Lula da Silva's party also received money from Cuba. It's been reported in the Brazilian press. This is not Otto Reich saying it. So th this is... A, a subversion of the institutions of democracy that is taking place under our noses in the United States is saying nothing. What is happening today in Nicaragua, for example, Daniel Ortega, again, is trying to subvert the democratic institutions that brought him to office. I have not seen a single protest from the State Department. The Washington Post has an editorial today about it. I hope the State Department will, will have the backbone to say something, speak up, uh, for democracy in Nicaragua, as it pretended to speak up for democracy in Honduras and made a terrible mistake, which, is, which Secretary Clinton, by the way, had to reverse. That's, a, that's another story. I, I hope we have some time to talk about what happened in Honduras because it was a colossal mistake by this administration. Such a mistake of judgment or intelligence or, or intention that it has to be examined. Because if we continue with that kind of attitude, we're going to undermine our interests. Third, the third policy prescription, uh, simple policy prescriptions, nonviolent policy prescriptions, is to the, for the United States to announce that it is ending its dependence on Venezuelan oil. People say, well, we can't do this. Of course we can do this. We import 6% of our consumption two year, from Venezuela. Two years ago, when the price of oil hit $140 a barrel, the American people, because of the magic of the marketplace, reduced our consumption of oil by 8% because the, the price of oil, was, the gasoline was too high. So we reduced our consumption in one year by more than we import from Venezuela in an entire year. Of course we can replace Venezuela. Second, uh, 400,000 barrels of the million, little over a million that we import from Venezuela, used to be a million and a half, by the way, it's already down. 
400,000 of that is such a heavy crude that it can only be refined in specially designed refineries in the United States. Chavez would have to drink that crude if, if, he, if the United States said no more crude from Venezuela. And that is another point. Venezuela has maximum 10-day storage for all of its production of oil. If the United States were to say no more oil from Venezuela, in 10 days they'd have to shut down the fields. It would cause such an economic for Venezuela that the Venezuelan question, the sanity of the men have in power in Caracas. Whatever, what they do about it, that's their decision. But the United States is defending its own interests. Uh, th those are the three uh, quick recommendations. There are a lot of others, a lot others, but I'm getting the, I'm getting the hook. So uh, I want to leave plenty of time for, for questions and uh, uh, maybe some comments from the audience. Thank you. Terrific. Regular warfare is the threat? What do we do about it? I, I don't think it's a principal threat, no. I think it is a threat. It's a factor. But I think the United States government's misdirection in this case, its uh, malign neglect, is the insistence that we deal only with counter-narcotics. Yes, there is a regular warfare in Colombia and manifestations of it in other countries. But in most of Latin America, we don't have irregular warfare. We simply are having political corruption. And that is not really warfare. It's something we've seen before. And we'll see again. And it can be dealt with. And we're not choosing to deal with it because we're not paying attention. I think the principal issue is that we have to get our thinking beyond the counter-narcotic stage. But that, in turn, is going to force us to come to the conclusion that we're going to have to be re-engage in the hemisphere. Somebody said that basically uh, the United Hugo Chavez is objective and Fidel Castro's was to have the United States disappear from the hemisphere. Well, for God's sake, they've succeeded. We've pretty much disappeared from the hemisphere. Uh, that's why as much is going on as is going on. And the fact that we're, what we are doing is directed against narcotics, attempting to spend millions, hundreds of millions of dollars of the taxpayers' money on alternative crops to cocaine when there's no market, transportation, or infrastructure for those crops demonstrates the insanity of what we're about. Can I, can I ask a, a sort of refinement to this? It seems to me maybe irregular warfare is less the issue than asymmetric warfare, and we, we talked a little bit about that in the previous panel. But could... I don't think anybody specifically has addressed the question uh, talked about misdirection or malign neglect, um, but could somebody uh, speak to the perceived, if not actual, role of um, President Obama himself and his seeming affinity for uh, Hugo Chavez, uh, if not his agenda, the man, um, in uh, multilateral forum and <laughs> within the uh, within the hemisphere, Otto, do you want to speak to that? You know, I think one of the problems with this president is we still don't know exactly who he is and what his uh, real intentions are. There's no question that, for example, a year ago when when he went to Trinidad and Tobago for the um, summit of the Americas, uh, that in my view, and I wrote at the time that he made a mistake. Um, with his warm embrace of Hugo Chavez. The, the, the handshake is sort of required at these diplomatic uh, meetings, but not the slap on the back and the big smile, all the conversations. People, in, especially the people that we are dealing with, the, our adversaries, see that kind of, uh, of uh, gentility as weakness. They don't see it as courtesy. Uh, and uh, in fact, the next day, we saw that Chavez had figured, oh, you know, I can, I can handle this guy. And he gave the president a book that was in itself an act of propaganda. Giving him this book 
which, which rose to the top of the Amazon list the very next day. An anti-American, anti-European uh, book that lies, frankly, about history that says that all the problems of Latin America are the fault of the United States and Europe. Uh, and this book was in Spanish. The president didn't know, well, he didn't know what he was getting, but he put himself in that situation. That's one example. You can, you can ascribe that to lack of experience, naivete, you know, being a rookie on the world stage. But how do you explain that when El Salvador has a presidential election where one of the two parties that were running head to head is the FM, was the FMLN party, the party of the guerrillas that had killed not only Salvadorians but American citizens in El Salvador. And several members of this Congress go to Salvador and say, also in Washington, that the Salvadorian people in their sovereign right, their sovereign uh, uh, use of, of their uh, ballot should be careful not to elect a government that could undermine democracy in El Salvador. Everybody knew who they were talking about. That the American Embassy and the State Department said that we were neutral in that election. How can we be neutral in an election where one of the parties as vice president has a man who is alleged in El Salvador of being responsible for the deaths of 1,500 people, including some of the American Marines and, and, and uh, AID contractors who were killed in what it's called the Zona Rosa murders in El Salvador. We, what kind of neutrality is that? So I, I don't know the answer to the question. Well, it's a pretty good answer to the question. Thank you. Uh, yes, okay, Ben, oh, I'm sorry. Comment. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, Forgive I me. I want to go back to Chris' question on, the, on irregular warfare. I think it might be more accurate, as you mentioned, if the question had been posed in terms of asymmetric warfare, because what Chavez is doing, he's using all instruments of power. I mean, at the very high end, he's buying, you know, very sophisticated, advanced uh, aircraft weapon systems from the Russians, and the purpose is to intimidate Colombia, to provide a shield behind which he can sub subvert other countries. But the thrust of, uh, of the strategy is really subversion and political warfare. And I just want to mention that, that the uh, uh, Chavez and, and his supporters uh, throughout the region uh, have developed a you know, very sophisticated strategy of subversion. And what the strategy involves, and we have seen it uh, uh, worked out, I think, in, in its most pure uh, uh, sense in Bolivia, is a, a combination of uh, political violence with the utilization of democratic methods, of uh, electoral methods to, to come to power. So you have this combination uh, that you see in Bolivia uh, that was inaugurated by the piqueteros in Argentina. I mean, even years before, where they would block roads, they would create chaos, they would intimidate the opposition. Uh, Evo Morab Morales uh, mobilized, you know, thousands of supporters to uh, to besiege La Paz. Uh, and so then you combine that type of pressure with elections, where the uh, caudillo manages to get himself elected and then proceeds to dismantle the institutions. Of, uh, of democratic government. So it's a very sophisticated method that allows uh, Chavez supporters to come to power through ostensibly legal means and therefore proceed to the consolidation of power. And that is what we do not have a response to. Right, great. Kurt? Again, I would say in response to both of my colleagues, uh, they're right, but what is the underlying cause? The underlying cause is the United States is not a player. We are not playing in the game. So what you say is perfectly right. By the way, Bolivia is not immune, nor has it had a history of nonviolence. They hung one of their presidents from a lamppost. I mean, uh, this is nothing new. Did you want to say something about Bolivia's traditions? <laughs> um, <laughs> great. I had uh, this lady here. Yes. Can we stick to one question, please, just so we can get some others represented, please? Thank you. OK. 
Okay. Anybody want to address the yeah, constitutionality I, I can address of very, very quickly? Uh, the uh, there is, as, as you very well know, there is no such article because that's a rhetorical question. The act that you describe has been declared uh, a crime by the uh, legal advisor of the armed forces. The the uh, it wasn't a kidnapping of the president. It was the deport deportation of the president of Celaya, who had already been he had an order of arrest issued against him by a 15 to 0 vote of the Supreme Court. So, and th there are plenty of uh, articles in the Constitution. I believe the article is 239. Um, I, I had that in my testimony when I testified back in July, the exact article, which uh, enables all of the actions that took place against Elia to take place constitutionally. They don't have an impeachment process, by the way. Yeah, right. the, the, deportation the deportation was, which was, was unfortunate. He should have been he should have been thrown in jail. Yeah. Yes, sir. That's right. That's right. Made in China. <laughs> Certainly Chinese. <laughs> Roger, we're going to have to get to a question here. <laughs> Well, I'm not sure that I'm the best to uh, to answer that, but uh, if I'm put on the spot, let me take a cut at it and others can uh, chime in. I, I happen to think that um, the work that Nancy's uh, Mangus Project is doing that brings us together annually now in these uh, sessions, but, but week by week is trying to push the sorts of information that uh, we're talking about here into the public domain um, to help translate it into political consequences, not, not simply informative, but actually have an impact from a policy point of view is, is the necessary first step, but is obviously not sufficient. Um, we have got to be taking the sorts of steps, uh, if not necessarily normalization of drug trafficking, at least the kinds of things that I think we all would agree have to be addressed in terms of um, calling a spade a spade with respect to Hugo Chavez's regime as a state sponsor of terror. Um, and the consequences that flow to it um, that I, I think um, Otto has described could have a quite salutary effect, um, turning wishful thinking into reality perhaps uh, in the not too distant future. But it, here's the bottom line, I think. As the president likes to say, whether we like it or not, we have a border across which all of these problems flow. 
They flow in the forms of people coming here to flee despotism or poverty or both in many cases. They flow in the forms of illegal substances or materials, some of which can be very deadly, not just to the individual consumer, but to a population. It is an insecure border. It is a border that is, if anything, becoming more porous, I think, as the intensity of the effort to penetrate it is, is ramping up and the sophistication of the means by which it's being penetrated is ramping up. So for all these reasons, we don't have the luxury of ignoring this. We will be hurt badly by it. And so I, I think the question is not so much what are we going to do about this as when are we going to do it? Are we really going to wait until that happens? We typically do. Can we afford to? I would suggest to you we cannot, especially when, as we have talked about today, whether the Secretary of Defense acknowledges it or not, we have enemy armies now operating from safe havens in our hemisphere that we know have the capacity to bring weapons of mass destruction to bear. So the cost of waiting could be exceedingly high, and I pray that this kind of conversation and the work that the Mengus Project is doing, and that all of these individuals are doing, for that matter, will translate into corrective action before that kind of horrible day arrives. Anybody else want to put a two-bit in on that? If not, question, yes, sir. Absolutely. Uh, as a matter of fact, the, uh, the Colombians, as is I mentioned, uh, uh, referred to earlier, have developed. Angel, is your mic on? Um, it's not working. Okay. Uh, have developed a very sophisticated uh, framework so for transitioning from the counterinsurgency stage to the stabilization state and the restoration of the state. And one interesting thing about this framework is that it was developed by the Colombians themselves. We did not go there and tell the Colombians, here is the plan, you follow it. They did it at the Superior School of War. A class got together. This was the project. They developed it. They presented it to the general staff. The general staff approved it. And then they raised it to the presidency. So it's of Colombian product 100%. And what they have done is they have uh, uh, divided this transition process into three stages. The first stage is the counterinsurgency stage where uh, the goal is to, uh, uh, to take back control of a particular area from the FARC. And at this stage, the focus is on military operations. And the military have the main mission at this point. Because the Colombians understand that civil society, the institutions, education, health, cannot be brought in until there is security. Security is primary. Once security is established, then they move on, that is to say, once the main elements of the FARC are driven out of a particular area, then the transition moves to the second stage. And this is a stage where the state, uh, uh, the government controls the area, but there are residual elements of the FARC. For instance, FARC infrastructure, the militias that the FARC has in place to enforce uh, its control. At this stage, the, uh, the, the focus is on providing security at the local level by using the police. So, so the, 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 the primary mission shifts from the military to the police. This is where police units are established in different, you know, in different towns uh, to provide a sense of law and order and security to the population. And at this stage, there is also the beginning of a provision of state services, uh, especially judicial functions. Because uh, these are areas that had never had a functional judiciary, so, so the law and order is brought in, uh, judicial functions, 
um, uh, emergency assistance to the population. And then the, the last and third stage is the stabilization stage, consolidation stage, and this is where the, 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 the military takes a very a low profile, a very low role. The primary, uh, uh, primary uh, 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 institutions at, at this stage are the civil institutions. Uh, there is a creation of infrastructure. Uh, the state attempts, well, tries to uh, develop the, 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 the area economically to link it with the rest of the country uh, to bring educational and health services. Those stages apply as well to the eradication of drugs because you know one of the reasons for the lawlessness in these uh, in these areas is of course that they are part of the uh, drug economy in the first stage uh, what happens is an eradication uh, that is to say you know drugs are, are crops are, are destroyed but the government on the Colombians understand that they cannot just leave the peasants to their own devices so they're giving emergency food uh, to help them to uh, uh, through a period of 90 days. Uh, in the second stage, uh, they uh, give them uh, uh, seeds and fertilizers and technical assistance so that they begin to develop subsistence agriculture, you know, beans and corn and things that they can use to feed themselves. And then in the third stage is when they, the government provides the assistance necessary to move them from subsistence to commercial agriculture. So it's a very, very sophisticated uh, uh, process that involves the eventual fading out of, a, of the military as the primary actors and then uh, the introduction of the uh, civil uh, institutions of society. <coughs> I want to, very quickly, we're out of time, but go ahead, quickly. One of the factors that one looks at in Colombia, and uh, I'm a ge one of my hobbies is geography. There's no country on earth with a more broken up uh, territory than Colombia. Three ranges of the Andes Mountains break it up. Colombia is no stranger to violence. It had a cycle of violence not much less bad than what we've been through in the 40s, which ended up with Rojas Pinilla. Uh, the problem Colombia has and it is getting government to isolated areas of the country where you cannot use rail and where perhaps the introduction of helicopters and other modes of transportation may make a difference. But to talk about replacing uh, cocaine with commercial crops for areas that are hugely isolated from markets uh, is part of the problem. We have to find, I think, some fundamental solutions that deal with the very unique problems of Colombia, which have to do with its geography, which is a contributing part to the difficulty of governing it. Can I just mention a quick comment in response to that, that the Colombians know that, and they're very much, uh, and what they're doing is they're putting the emphasis on secondary and tertiary roads, well, that so help. that they could unite you know, these, these isolated locations to towns where they can sell their products. They didn't do, yeah, you're and right. then, then, of course, there is the, the linkage to, to, the, to the main in infrastructure system, yeah. Can I say thank you to uh, both this wonderful second panel and uh, to our audience, and of course, most especially to Nancy Mengus, who's made all of this possible. Um, this is uh, a subject that we are serious about, I, I think, at the Center for Security Policy and with our colleagues here, um, not only, as has just been suggested, in terms of the, um, the here and now, but, but going forward. So we appreciate your interest. We hope you'll help us translate this interest into policy impact for all the reasons that have been so well described here today. So thank you again for coming, and uh, please check out the Center for Security Policy's website, securefreedom.org, for transcripts and uh, video and other information that might be of use to you if you wish to help with this very important effort. Thank you. <laughs>